the title of this presentation is called Spatial Seeds, and uh, uh, in many ways it is very working. Um, and then it is inspired from the seeds by uh, Xenakis. Uh, the work, uh, I started this work some, uh, some years ago, and primarily sort of uh, working through the symmetry, sort of properties. And, um, and uh, well, to begin with, for those of you who haven't met me at the Latourette in the last meeting, um, my name is Thanos Ekonomou. I'm, uh, I'm an architect and professor at Georgia Tech, and uh, I teach uh, uh, computational design. So when Thomas came to Tech about uh, three or four years ago for a year, sort of we, we reworked several of these uh, formalisms, and among the stuff, that, among the projects we did, we revisited this work, and uh, that's what we're going to show you today. So, in many, so where we start here is really the the sieves, and the most of you you must be familiar with that. Is this uh, uh, this very powerful idea really of starting with modules and concatenating these modules to to uh, under union intersection to produce highly expressive um, sort of orderings or distribution of points in a line. Uh, of course, that thing suggests that you can represent basically everything. You, you, it's, it's a gorgeous system to produce uh, a sequencing that can be applied to pitch scales, um, rhythm sequences, patterns of loudness, density, timber, everything that has to do with an ordering. Of course, Xenakis, as uh, we are all familiar, uh, he, he dealt with spatial structures too, and that's kind of a, a, a very exciting condition. It's not just about the spatial structure of the line, but he dealt with many other ones. And you're going to see here how we do have a general solution for them, or at least a, a reworking of this stuff. Um, the, the key line, I guess, the, in the third paragraph, it's from his book, uh, when he sort of uh, presents the whole idea of the sieves. Um, he says, well, that, uh, that some fundamental sort of aspects of the composition by giving, whenever it exists, a more hidden symmetry derived from the decomposition of a modulus. So by concatenating this very simple sort of series, sometimes you have hidden uh, sort of uh, uh, shapes and patterns that emerge. And that's basically what you have tried to do here. So uh, we're architects, so we will be starting the, we will show how some of the work that we are doing, it is derived uh, and is sort of very much related with uh, aspects of spatial composition. What you see here, uh, it is um, from some work back in the 50s that has been entirely sort of back in vogue on, on weave designs and field designs. Uh, that's from the, uh, from the work of Erwin Hauer, which is basically a three-dimensional structure, but it's a surface in three dimensions. Now, patterns like that, they have an interest, uh, but uh, really their, part of their beauty as well is the fact that they resist the interpretation in terms of the module. Uh, the module that in, in, in various iterations does the whole thing. So if I go back to the previous slide, you see that, and you, so you see the continuity of the pattern, and uh, almost you, pr you appreciate the fact that it is not as easily sort of, uh, it doesn't render immediately um, this relationship to the module. And even this module here, which makes everything, this comprises by four parts. Uh, so four of those and four of those make, uh, make the pattern, which then make the whole overall thing. So uh, patterns like that, uh, whether it is about lines, whether it's about uh, planes, whether it's about spaces, um, there are different formalisms that they've been used to address them, and uh, one of them, uh, one of the most powerful ones, is group theory. Um, the, an application of group theory, an explicit application of group theory, partitions in architectural design, um, it is by, basically by uh, Lionel uh, Marx, by Marx and Stenman in the 70s, where they took existing sort of projects, and you see here different projects, the, uh, by Ledoux, by Cerson, and by Corbusier, by, and Frank Lloyd Wright, and showing how these sort of designs, they can be, um, they show a very careful and precise, and precise understanding of symmetry, or of a module, uh, superimposition of modules that create an architectural design. So again, these are projects ranging from the 17th all the way to the 20th century, but a, a group theoretic representation of those is given by the, in the 70s. Now, whenever you, take, whenever you deal with, a, with any sort of group decomposition, immediately you see that this can be applied to any different domain, as Xenakis was also saying, that if you do have a linear sequence, this you can, it can apply to everything that can have a linear, a linear sequence. So you see here, for example, the 12 
if you care about the 12ness and the specific kind of 12ness, uh, these are three different uh, modes. The one is um, the, the house of the entertainment to the left, and you probably will find it funny if you actually see what, how Ledoux was uh, producing this house for the gentleman, where the, there is an entry and 12 uh, uh, rooms around. There is the class um, 12 uh, uh, um, the 12 tone circle, the Johannes Eaton 12 tone circle, and there's also the 12 tone uh, equal temperament. All of them they have the same structure. Now, what we actually do, and I think it's actually interesting when it comes to Xenakis' work, is this subgroup uh, partition. You see here a classic building, a classic, literally, the Pantheon. Uh, the Pantheon, those of you who have entered inside, it makes sense because this kaleidoscopic aggregation of various symmetries. You see here, for example, this is a total plan, but you can partition it in different parts and each of them uh, has a different kind of symmetry. It has to do with the rotation and the reflection. So it has a symmetries of eight and, uh, and, and fours. Significantly, it has also symmetries of seven. And that's why the, uh, if you've if you ever been in the Pantheon, you will see that the, the upper rotunda doesn't match with the next, but it matches only uh, in, the, in the four quadrants. Otherwise, because it has a 28-ness inside it. Uh, but otherwise, you can look at other designs. Here, this is the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, window design. And you see here, the, to the, the complete design is here in the end. And these parts, starting from here all the way down there, they represent uh, different parts that have reflections or rotations. So this one has only rotation, this one has only vertical and, uh, and horizontal reflections, and so forth. So the, really, what you're saying here is that this thing has to, be, has to be understood as an aggregation of all the previous ones. This is a, 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 an Aram Sindler design, the um, a library. Again, this is the complete design. And you see here how these parts, when they are added, they make that. So it's not unlike what we're actually discussing. It is a sum of various configuration produce a thing in the end which is highly asymmetric but the parts themselves, they have symmetry. So this here shows, the, in the black, it is the beaten up shapes that we all know very well, you know, rectangle, equilateral triangles, squares, pentagons. What you see here, this column and this column here, that's the things that they're actually interested in, which is the structures that show all the possible embedded relationships, group theoretic relationships that you can have uh, within the shape. We will, we will show you an application that makes that very, very easy uh, rather than uh, having this representation here. So what we do here, we have, so we have shapes, we have structures that go on with that, and uh, we think that if we combine the two, we can actually have a quite nice formal system that can be applied basically to, to everything that, has to, that is amenable to formal composition. You can have diagrams, you can have shapes, you combine them, and you can have in the end these shape grammars. So for example, if you do have a shape like this, a rectangle with a dot, which um, disambiguates the symmetry, you can in instantiate all of those as space and relationships. And you can then apply all of these relationships to this lattice to produce uh, constructively a design that you have here down in the end that all its parts, they signify different conditions. And if you, if you look at this carefully, you would see that there are different things happening in all of them. There are various group uh, uh, generators that apply, whether they are reflections, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, and so forth. And here is a, a, a sort of four different representations of a simple spatial study like this. Now, there is something bigger here, and um, wherever we're talking about the sieves as, as a line, or wherever we're talking about two-dimensional or three-dimensional, this, uh, this table here shows the complete structure of Euclidean space which basically means that uh, you can, they have 10 different ways of inquiring about symmetrical structures. If, for example, you look at the cube, the cube has a center of symmetry, and it's a three-dimensional shape. So it should be in this category here, uh, where the GIJ, the I, means periodicity, as uh, Xenaki says, or sort of um, um, some sort of translational structure. And the three is the space. So zero three means zero translation in three-dimensional space or a point in space. If, for example, you look at G12, 
That means that there are here designs, lines that are embedded into a two-dimensional space. G11, these are lines that you have that are embedded in one dimensional space. So these 10 structures give a fantastic sort of an overall framework to inquire about any uh, symmetries none whatsoever. So here is a, an example of what we mean. Four shapes on top, uh, they look very different. We have names to call them. The, 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 the brick, for example, is this one to the right. Uh, the shaved square prism is here. Um, that's a truncated pyramid. All of them, they have something in common. They have the commonness of eightness. They all co consist of eight parts, the one within the other. Uh, you see here a visual representation of the geometrical loci of the points that remain invariant. For example, this shape here has only a rotational symmetry, which means that the eight parts that consist, if they put together, they create this truncated pyramid. Or these uh, generators here generate sort of um, they generate the brick on top. And these are the parts that I showed you earlier. When for every uh, shape that you see here on top, this is the underlying structure that is embedded within that. Um, at the very least, this one suggests, for example, that shapes like this, uh, the, rec the rectangles, rectangular prisms or cubes, they have an incredible sort of hidden symmetry within them, and these uh, representations here capture them. So the, the underlying machinery for that is the group theoretic formalism that, that requires three axioms. Uh, the, the multiplication, that, that the multiplication is associative and you have the identity. You have to have zeros and all that. That's, we can talk about it. For those of you that are interested in group theory, you can discuss that uh, later on. But what we really care here is two relationships. The, the part relationship, which means what is hidden or what is uh, vested within a bigger sort of uh, uh, structure. And you see here, for example, and that's actually the most pedagogical design you can actually put together. This is a square. And you see here that the complete square consists of eight pieces. These four, they have a vertical and horizontal symmetry. These four, they have a rotational symmetry. And these four, they have diagonal symmetries like that. Now, this design looks and feels very different from that. If you take now this, you see that there are two different kind of groups you can have. You can have this part, which has only vertical symmetry, or you can have this part, you can have only uh, horizontal, or this one that has a rotational. And you see how these parts are embedded within the bigger structure, which is embedded within the bigger structure. And you see then that this part, for example, if it has a rotational symmetry, relates to all three on top. So that's, uh, it's very pedagogical, but sort of explains that kind of nested structure that I think uh, Yanis Xenakis was talking about. The, the other uh, relationship that we are interested in is this conjugacy, or basically it's a relationship of equivalence. Again, to make it clear pictorially, you see here, for example, how this part now is collapsed to that. Why? Because this design and this design, they're both related by reflections. So we have only one type of reflections and not, type, and not two types. So basically, two different partitions, the one that takes account of, very, of every possible uh, transformation, and the one that uh, shows only the qualitatively different ones. And this uh, sort of design here, just uh, it's, um, it shows all the 98 possible ways that you can, you can configure, con uh, that you can identify distinct configuration within the cube. Cube, uh, I mean, if anything, that is a kind of a telltale sign of uh, why um, some shapes, they resist their, uh, their interpretation. If you see here, for example, that's a cube with an oblong. And if you look all the way in the top, there are 48 oblongs all around that they, they satisfy the same condition uh, relationship to the cube. And within all of this, these 98 are all the possible sort of ways, distinctly uh, possible ways you can identify parts. So in that, all I, all I try to set up here is to say that uh, configurations have a symmetry. Many people deal with symmetry. But what I think it is interesting for this presentation here is this part relationship that exists in configurations, which you see them uh, here in these diagrams. And the more complex this thing is, the more sort of uh, um, makes the interpretation somewhat 
more sort of uh, aesthetically pleasing. So in that sense, we can uh, then think about what happens when we start the partitioning in, the, uh, in specific lines. So if, for example, for a scene, you want to uh, create a 12-ness, but it could be anything, you start by mapping everything into regular sort of uh, polygons. Here you see the, here the, there's a 12-ness, and you apply four different kinds uh, of, uh, uh, all the different kinds of transformation you can have. What you see here um, is the, um, the figure, the, 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 sort of the cycle of a mutation that, uh, that uh, comes out of the transformation. And uh, if you do have a 12-ness here, you have 12 parts, and you apply the uh, identity, you have basically 12 cycles of order one, and this is all it says, this one here. Okay, so the, the 12 gone has, uh, these are the operations that they leave it invariant, and these are the cycles of permutation that leave it invariant. I think before I go into that, Thomas, if you, if you don't mind, you can show the, the sieve application. What, um, what they did here is that the requirement of substructures in the to put together software, Thomas put together software, that can actually do the well, um, this, the software has been growing and we've been adding new features. Um, this is the very latest version, so I want to resist clicking around too much since we have found a couple of bugs. But, um, but um, essentially, the, the two main targets uh, which, which we, we've so far been implemented, on the one hand, we have the, the subgroup structure, which is seen in this graph here, where you have basically the full group at the top, and, and you can see, very similar to what Thanos has shown you in his images, how you can decompose these structures into um, uh, smaller groups, which, which, which talks about how well certain uh, geometries or, uh, or other entities can be perhaps combined with each other, and, um, and, uh, and which ones, if you overlay them, have a sort of uh, maybe a, they would like if you combine two primes, they would maybe have to generate something completely new, and other times they're sort of embedded within each other. And um, in this case, we have uh, these are prismatic structures. So on the right hand side, you're actually looking at a prism which has a front face and a back face. So, so um, the, the black circles are showing the, the front face and, and the, 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 the elements that are active in this in this perspective. And the circles are showing the elements which would be on a back face. So you can see in, in three dimensions, um, what Thanos showed you beforehand with the square, in three dimensions you have a lot more complexity because um, you don't only have uh, 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 reflections and rotations on one axis, but you also have a sort of, uh, uh, basically it happens due to the reflection which is perpendicular to the rotational axis here. Um, then on the on the left hand side we have the information the various notations because it, it developed independently maybe in in various fields and various mathematicians have have used their own notation um, like Weil and Polya perhaps um, and then the, it is used in, in chemistry and of course in crystallography and um, and so they all developed their own notation and we wanted to be able to to jump in between these so we showing them all on the left along with some um, some uh, information like the order of the group and, and how many indexes of this specific group could be found in in the overlaying group. Um, and then the newest addition, um, because I mean, so the, the subgroups are one thing that might be of interest, but another very interesting aspect of symmetry is that it allows you a certain amount of enumeration of, of configurations, especially because um, for example, if you want to uh, color the nodes of, of let's say, a square, um, and and you want the distinct, the different distinct ways of coloring the nodes, and and so you don't want to, even though let's say, you could say the two top nodes would be red, maybe, um, and maybe I can I can show it here, if I find the right one. Oh, I can't. I thought it used to be colored red. Anyway, so if you could say the two top nodes are red, the two bottom nodes are black, and vice versa, another version would be the two bottom nodes are red and the top ones are black, but in fact, of course, it's the same configuration because all you would have to do is rotate it by 180 degrees, 
and you, you would see that you'd have the same Im image. So Polia and the cycle index, which is computed at the bottom here, um, allows you to actually count the non-equivalent configurations, which are not so easily detected, perhaps, by the eye. Um, whereas, of course, for, for, for the number of four, it can maybe be done manually. But of course, with increasing numbers, um, it gets more and more complex. And um, and it's not really something you want to do manually, because it's uh, fairly error-prone work. <clears throat> so um, if we go back to the presentation, so this is basically the, the, the way how one derives this cycle index. You look at the different operations, and you look at what the operation does to your structure if you, if you apply it. And, and, and this allows you to, once you sum up all these individual indi indices which we got on the previous slide, you get the, the cycle index, which is then used for, for enumeration purposes. But before, uh, before you enumerate, you have, so the cycle index gives you, represents the structure of, of the thing you're enumerating, but you also need to know, for example, in the, if, if you're dealing with the coloring of the nodes, how many colors do you want to apply to the nodes? So you might have two colors, or you, you might have four colors, so you, you obviously need to represent each of these um, attributes uh, which can be applied with a variable. So you, you, you put together your figure in inventory, and then you substitute this figure inventory into the, the cycle index, which is uh, uh, one of the, the things, one of the main points, basically, in Polya's theory of enumeration, um, because it is not very intuitive, this way of, of saying that, um, of, of, of substituting, uh, um, for example, f1 to the power of 12 um, in, in, in representing it in, in, in this sort of uh, way. So anyway, you, so you, you plug in all your numbers into your formula, and, and, and then what you basically would need to do is to solve this long uh, um, equation. Um, of, of course, there, there are certain mechanisms that can make this uh, happen easily and autom automatic. So uh, um, at the end of the day, you, you end the coefficients of the expansion give the non-equivalent configurations under the considered symmetry. So um, we'll, we'll have a, a better example in a minute. Um, this is an, another, an, I mean, there, there, there are many solvers out there on the internet, but this is one project by another student of Thanos's, Brian Whitehead, and um, he, he he put together this applet uh, for the specific purpose of of solving uh, these substitutions. So, for example, if you have um, let's have a look where we have. Uh, Good example here. So for the for the square, for example, um, if we, if you're interested in in the coloring, um, you can see here, this is a cycle index that has been solved. These are the coefficients that come out of the 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 the, the, the expansion of, of the equation, and and so you could see, for example, that if you have uh, four different colors, um, uh, represented in this case by x, y, z, and r, you have six different configurations of how to do that. And, um, and, and this would mean, for example, to x to the power of 4 would mean that all four nodes are represented by, uh, by one color, um, which, which obviously means that there's only one possible solution. Even though I think in this case, we're not actually talking about nodes, which makes it a little bit confusing, because so far we've been talking about nodes, but we're talking about the, the symmetry elements, and they're actually not only four in the queue, but the, the queue, uh, the, the square actually is composed out of eight elements and not out of four. So, um, so in order to automate this, because um, what Polya does basically, he gives you a number. He tells you, okay, there are three different configurations, and um, and he doesn't actually give you the the, the, the actually configurations. He just gives you that the absolute number, and 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 so if you're searching for the configurations, what you have to do is. For, for, exam for the example of the fourness, you have to take the supergroup, uh, the, the symmetric group of the, of the number four. So here on the left-hand side, we have all 24 possible permutations if you have four elements of, of way, ways to, to shuffle around the pack. Um, and, it, and, and, 
and the, 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 the square only uses eight of those uh, possible permutations. So what you have, you have 16, you have 16 permutations left, which can't be applied to the square because they would, they would imply cutting the, the square apart and, and recombining it in a new configuration, which, which isn't basically um, allowed in, 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 in the sort of symmetry sense, in the topological sense of, of looking at the square. But if you're looking at various colorings, then of course that might be an option. Um, so using the 16 permutations to the left, um, you, you can uh, derive the colors which are now here represented by, uh, by the labels. Um, which for, in this example, if you have four colors and you want to color the nodes, you have uh, three possible ways of, of doing that for the square. I think uh, we'll leave it at that. Here, here are the, the, the possible uh, colorings for the, for the square from, from one color through to, through to four colors. And, um, and uh, in the, the next step would be to implement this also in, in the application and then um, to apply it, uh, replace the colors by numbers so that you have a sort of division of the interval if you think of the interval as being sort of the circle. Um, yeah, thank you.